Welcome everybody to my 18th lecture. Today we talk about conservation and transformation of energy. Why is that important? Well, if we talk about energy problems of the world, the question first of all is, do we need at all energy and why do we need energy to do some work or to do run some machines? And this is what I try to explain you today. So here you see a simple example. We see a crash of two cars. Probably these cars had high speed before. There was kinetic energy, as we say as physicists. And then they crashed. Now there has been some deformation of the cars. And afterwards, nothing is left over. All the energy is gone. So it looks like that energy is used up and disappears. But in physics, in reality, it's a bit different. And that's what I want to explain you. So in other words, today we have to talk a little bit about physics and I selected five quantities which are important in physics. So it's energy, force, work, mass and power. That's what I selected. These five words you have to understand in a physics sense and I guess it's not too complicated even if you are not a very physics affine person. So these five quantities are listed here in this table. And in physics, you use the same words as in the everybody's language. But you have to know that in physics, the words have a much more precise meaning than normally. So let's take the example of power. Power can mean all kind of things in the natural language, but in physics, it has a very strict meaning. That is why I would like to bring you those things into your attention. In physics, we use these quantities which have some names and as the language of physics is mathematics, it's very practical to use instead of the words, just symbols. So we have the symbols M, F, W, E and P for mass, force, work, energy and power. And in physics, all these quantities have units so that you know how to measure them. The mass is measured in kilogram, force is measured in Newton, Work is measured in Joule, energy as well, and power is measured in Watt. These units belong to an international system of units. So it's everywhere the same on the whole world, except maybe the US and England. They use still a lot of strange units like inches and barrels and whatever. So in the next five minutes, maybe a few minutes more, I will go through all these five quantities and I start with the simplest one, which is the mass. So what is a mass? Well, I brought an example here to this lecture. It took me a long time to find a stone, which is exactly one kilogram. So this is one kilogram. This is one of the basic units in whole physics. Everybody has to know what a kilogram is. I brought another mass, which is this tennis ball here. The tennis ball weights 60 grams about. I just measured it. So what is the difference between the stone and the ball? Well, the difference is their mass. What is mass? Well, many people think about mass as being the weight. Yeah, this stone here has a high weight and the ball has a smaller weight. And that is for many people what mass is about. But this is not really the best way to think about it. Because imagine you go to the moon, then the stone has only a sixth of the weight. So it's much lighter. And if you go to the space station in free space, then both have no weight at all. So what happens now in the space station? You have two objects, a ball and a stone, and they have both no weight. Do they still have mass? Yes, of course, the mass is still the same. So the mass does not change depending on the environment. So what is mass in free space if there's no weight? Well, the easiest thing what you can do is the following. If you have a light mass and you throw it to somebody, for example, if I throw the ball against myself, then it does not really hurt. Yeah, it's a small mass, therefore it doesn't hurt. If I do the same with a stone, which I won't do at the moment, then I find out that this will hurt a lot. So the more it hurts when you are thrown with it, the higher the mass is. 
We can also define the mass as a certain number of certain atoms in the stone and as long as you have this high number of atoms in the stone you will have a high mass. Okay, now I guess everybody got it. So the mass is a very important property of all the things you can work with. Now let's take the next quantity, which is the force. The force is something which I think the easiest way to understand is if you take a rope. So if you pull the rope, then you feel the force. Yeah. So a force is always there when you pull on a rope or something equivalent, there are, for example, electric forces, then it's like having a pull by a rope, but there's no rope visible because the force is not done by a rope, but it's done by some electric fields. The special thing about forces is that they can not only be strong or weak, but they always have a direction. Yeah, you can have a force which goes into this direction and you can have a force which goes horizontally or a force which goes up and down. So this you should remember, a force always has a direction and it's like pushing somewhere or pulling somewhere and the mass has no direction, it's just the property of the object you have. The nice thing about physics now is that you have only a few of these quantities of these basic properties and then you can put relations between them. Yeah? For example, I can put the stone on this rope here. So now I have a stone on this rope and because of the weight of the stone, it's the stone is pushing on the rope. Here I combine an object which has a mass. The stone is exactly one kilogram. I put it on the rope and the rope is pulling my hand downwards. So there's a force on the rope and the force pulls my hand downwards. The direction is downward because the cause of the force is the weight and the weight always goes to the center of our earth. And in physics then you can calculate those things quantitatively. You have a relation between a mass and its weight. The weight is different on every planet. On our Earth, the weight is calculated as 9.81 Newton per kilograms multiplied with the mass. So this mass, the stone of one kilogram here, has a force which is 9.81 Newton pushing me downwards. And if I would like to change the weight of the stone, I would have got to go to the moon. Actually, this 9.81 is not everywhere exactly the same on our planet. If I go on top of a mountain, it's a bit smaller. Or if I go to the North Pole, it's a bit stronger. So depending where, I, where you are, your weight changes a little bit. The mass of the stone is always the same. The mass is always one kilogram of this stone. And uh, the same is with your body. Normally people say I have a weight of, for example, 80 kilograms. But what they actually mean is they have a mass of 80 kilograms. So depending on, on which planet they are, their weight will be very different, but the mass will always be the same. The only way to change the mass is to eat less, but this is more or less impossible, as most of you know. Now the question is, can you change these forces? And mankind has invented already thousands of years ago simple machines which changes the forces. An example here is a tackle. You can also take a lever or a branch. These are all simple instruments or simple machines which change the forces. So let's take this example of the tackle here. You have a rope, you pull up a big box of 20 kilograms. 20 kilograms is the mass of the box. The force or the weight of the box is 196 Newton. You have to multiply the mass with 9.81, which is a constant of our Earth. And then you get this 196 Newton. 196 Newton is quite a lot. 
you have to be very strong to pull this up. But if you use this tackle here, you can divide this force by two, you get 98 Newton. So you have to use less force to carry this big box here. You can have a different type of tackle and you divide these forces by three or four or five. So you can make machines which allow you to use very small forces to pull up heavy boxes. Now we come to the next important quantity, which is work. So what is work? Yeah, you all have done some work already in the past. It's also work to watch a video like this one. But work in a physics sense is very well defined. You need work if you have a force and you want to do some action against this force. And the stronger the force is, the more work you need. And the further you draw this force away, the larger the work is. Yeah? So the work is defined as a force multiplied with the distance in which you act against this force. The typical example is you move up in the fifth floor and you have to carry heavy boxes. So the work which you have to do is you have to take the weight of the box and multiply it with the height and then you get the work which you have to do to carry up these boxes. And it's clear, the bigger the mass of the boxes is, the higher is the weight, and the higher the weight is, the larger the work is you have to do. And if you take a um, floor which is twice as high, then you also have to take twice as much of the work. So this is how physically you measure work and you calculate work. So it's a product of the force and the distance in the simplest example. So let's take again the example of the tackle from last time. You have this 20 kilograms. You want to carry it upwards by one meter. The force is 196 Newton. So one meter times 20 kilograms times 9.81 gives you 196 Joule. So you need 196 joules to carry this box up by one meter. If you now have this simple machine, you need much less force. You need only 98 Newton force. So you could think you only need half of the work, but this is not the case. Because if you understand how a tackle works, you will find out that you have to pull on this rope twice as long. So you have to pull two meters of the rope to carry the box up by one meter. So two meter is the distance of where you have to pull against. 98 Newton is the force. So the product of the two is 196 Joule. And this is exactly the same number as we had before. So with this kind of machines, you can change the forces, but you cannot change the amount of work you are doing. So these nice machines, help you a lot, but they don't generate any work. The work has still to be done by yourself in the same amount, independent on how the machine looks like. It will always be 196 joules to carry this box upwards. So this kind of machine cannot change the work which you have to do. Let's take another example. Let's take this wrench. This is another simple machine. So you use the wrench to screw something up. You need a lot of force for that maybe. And in order to reduce the force, you take a wrench which is, has a certain length, L here. The longer this distance is, the easier it is to turn the wrench. Here again, the point is that the force becomes smaller and smaller if you go further and further outside. But the amount of work we have to do to screw something in which needs a certain force, then it's the same amount of work because if you go further outside, you have to push less. But the uh, circle which you have to go with your tool is larger. So the distance that you move is larger. So the product of distance and force is again the same. But then of course, people who have to work a lot and they have to work every day doing the same kind of stuff. At some point they say, isn't it possible to invent a machine which does the work for me by itself? 
So people were thinking a lot on constructing machines which did not only make the forces smaller but which also did the work themselves. And those machines are called perpetual motion machines because they continue to do some motion, they continue to work without that you have to do anything yourself. And the question is, can you build that and how do you do it? And a very intuitive machine which works like that is the following machine which I show you now. So you should see the machine here. This is just a wheel which can rotate. And then you have small masses at these levers here. And the trick is now the following. These levers can have two positions. On the left you see the position where they are radially. So from the center of the wheel they go outside. And the mass at the end has a certain weight. And on the left side then these weights push the wheel downwards. So there's a rather large turning moment because these masses you can think about for example lead bowls which are very heavy they pull down the wheel on the left side. Then if these masses go down on the right side they are pulled up again but now the lever goes to another position so that on the right side the distance between the lead bolt and the center of the wheel is smaller so those masses try to pull the wheel around in the direction of the clock but this turning moment is smaller than on the left side because here the distance to the center is smaller and the lever arm is smaller therefore the turning moment on the right side is smaller than on the left side so the overall turning moment is the difference of the two which means this wheel will spin around against the clock. So this is a very simple and intuitive picture and it has to work this way you might think and therefore people started to build those machines and I have a nice YouTube video which shows you how this machine really works. So in this video here they didn't take any lead bowls and levers. Instead they just took some plastic bottles with some liquid in it. But the principle is the same. It's even more clever to do it this way. So again you see on the left side the bottles are more horizontal. So there's more weight to the outside of the wheel. And if the bottles go up the position is more close to the wheel so they have a smaller lever arm and this is how it works and to see it works really nicely. Of course such a machine would solve all our energy problems but unfortunately the video is fake and it doesn't work this way and if you really look into the more details of these wheels you find out that it's a nice idea but it cannot work and if you calculate the total amount of energy which it produces and you find out it doesn't produce anything. So the trick looks nice because you use the gravitation as an energy source but unfortunately it doesn't work this way so people have to continue to look for this perpetuum mobile. As you know work is somehow related to energy and now we come to our next quantity which we wanted to discuss Energy has the letter E and is also measured as Joule and energy and work is physically basically the same more or less. It's just used in a different context. So energy is the ability to do some work. So if you want to do some work you need energy and work is something which belongs to a process. For example if you want to carry something upstairs you have to have energy, so you have to have the ability to do the work and carrying things upwards needs a certain amount of work. So this is the, the relation between the two and quantitatively it's exactly the same. So if it takes 5 Joule to carry something upwards, you need an energy of 5 Joule to be able to do it. So in this sense energy and work is just 
more or less the same, just used in a different context. And energy itself, it's also nothing unique. There are very many different forms of energy. We had at the beginning the example of the cars. If they have a high speed, they have a lot of energy. So there's energy of motion, you call it kinetic energy. Another example is energy by rotation, which is a certain form of motion. Then, as you all know, there are magnetic forces and electric forces and using these forces you can also do work electrically and magnetically and you can also have energy stored in forms of magnetic or electric fields. Then there's gravitational energy. We had already the example. Here's my stone again of one kilogram. If I let it fall it will hurt my feet and so if it falls at the beginning it has what we also call the potential energy in the gravitational field. Then it starts to move downwards. Then it has kinetic energy and it gets faster and faster. And at the end it hits my feet. And there it produces some deformation energy. And because it hurts then I will have some acoustic energies. Another kind of energy is nuclear energy, the, the one which you use in nuclear power plants. And we also have chemical energy. If you burn something, you produce energy from the chemical bindings. Typical example is a coal power plant where you make use of it. And also heat is a form of energy. You need energy to heat something up. And radiation like light or infrared or microwave, all these kind of radiation are also related to energy. So uh, there's a huge variety of energy. And the nice thing with energy is you can convert one type into another type. And we will see that during the lecture in many cases. As I just showed you with the stone, the stone has gravitational energy first and then it has motion energy and so on. So you can convert energy from one kind to another kind, but the really important point here, and that is the subject of the lecture here, is that energy in total is conserved. So you cannot generate energy from nothing. You cannot do work without having energy which you put in. And you also cannot destroy energy. Energy can only be converted in a different form. So in the example of the car crash at the beginning. First you had the energy in forms of petrol as chemical energy, then the cars went up to speed, then you had a kinetic energy, motion energy, and then they crashed. And during the crash there's some heat produced and the heat dissipates in the environment. So finally if you drive a car, what is left over at the end is some heat in the environment. That's all. So you converted the chemical energy of the petrol into some heating up of your environment. So energy is not lost, but it's quite useless. You cannot do anything with the heating of the environment for your own purposes. So the very important law of nature is energy is always conserved. And this is one of the best tested laws in nature because everybody is interested in producing energy from nothing and selling the energy or the work which is done by it. So the total energy of an isolated system is always constant. You can put energy into the system, you can convert it inside and you can put energy out of the system. But if the system is isolated and no energy is coming in or out, the total amount of energy in the box is always the same. And if you want to do any work, you need energy, of course. If you are a human being, you have to get the energy in form of food. You eat your bread and butter and then you have energy inside of you and then your muscles can do some work, some mechanical work. But also here, if you don't have anything to eat anymore, at some point there's no way for you to do any work anymore. I told you already the conservation of energy has been tested many times and all the tests have found out that the total amount of energy really is conserved. There is no way of changing that. There is complete experimental evidence. 
but there's not only experimental evidence. In addition, there is a theoretical evidence in a certain sense. What do I mean with that? Well, one of the most important physicists was Emmy Noether, and she has proven in 1915 that the law of conservation of energy can be derived mathematically from the most general equations we have in physics and can be related to a symmetry, to the time symmetry. This now sounds complicated, but that means that as long as the theoretical building of physics is valid, the law of energy conservation has also to be valid. And these basic foundations of physics, they are proven by all the experiments physicists have done up to now. So what was so great about what Amy Noether found? Well, what she was able to do is that she relates conservation laws, and there are several of conservation laws in physics, not only the conservation of energy, there's also a conservation of momentum and of charge and of many other things. And what she found out is that these conservation laws can be related to symmetries in nature. So whenever you find a symmetry in nature, you can derive a conservation law from that, according to Amy Noether. And this is great because, as you might know, I'm a particle physicist and I look for new forces and new laws in physics. And the way we look at it is often that we only look for symmetries. And wherever we find a symmetry, we can then use the formalism of Amy Noether and find a new conservation law. To repeat this important point, the conservation of energy is related to the symmetry of time. So as long as the physics laws do not depend on time, so they are the same laws as 100 years ago or a million years ago, as long as this is valid, energy conservation will be valid on our planet. So in this sense, it's still nice to think about new ideas to build some new perpetual motion machines, but there's no chance to succeed. Yeah, just because of Amy Noether, as long as you are not able to change the symmetry of time, you will not be able to make a perpetual motion machine. It's still nice if you look at the internet, you find hundreds of ideas on how to build these perpetual motion machines. And it's always a good exercise to think at which point they have to be fake. But of course, in videos, it's very hard to really prove what they have done because in videos you can do anything. Uh, in addition to having lectures on energy transition, you can do also a lot of fake things. Now we come to the end of the lecture, to the fifth important quantity for our lecture, and this is power. And power in physics is a very restricted usage. Power is simply energy divided by time or work divided by time. So if you have a certain amount of energy in joules and you do some work with it and it takes a certain amount of time, you divide the work by the time and then you get the average power which you have applied. Power is measured in watt and um, watt is nothing else than joule per second. That is the only physics correct way to use the word of power. But of course, in everyday life, you use power in many different aspects. Before I finish the lecture now, I want to point out a few other things which are important to understand physics formulas properly. So as I told you, every quantity has a symbol and the symbol has a unit and the unit comes from the international unit system. So the mass, we had the kilogram, but of course you can convert it to grams or milligrams or tons or megatons. And to do so, you have to apply the correct factors. So the formulas look formally in the way as I wrote it down here. The symbol is equal to a number, which gives you the size, and multiplied with a unit. And for the unit, you preferably use standard units. But of course, you can use prefixes so like kilo and milli. And here I gave you a whole list of these prefixes, which are quite often used in physics and often very important. So you 
no probably a lot of them. Terra is 10 to the 12, a 1 with 12 zeros, so it's a very big unit. Giga is 10 to the 9, Mega 10 to the 6, Kilo 10 to the 3, and then Hecto and Deca are not so commonly used, but still I like Hectopascal for the air pressure is used. DC is used for liquids often. DC liter, for example, is a tenth of a liter. Centi is known from centimeters, a hundredth. Milli is a thousandth. Micro is a millionth. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. Pico is 10 to the minus 12. In particle physics, this list continues. Then you have Femto for the size of an atomic nucleus. And then it continues a few more, but those are not so common, so you don't have to learn them now. And the last comment is about unit combinations. You can do all kinds of combinations of units. A few of them you have to know for this lecture especially well. One is that Watt is the same as Joule per second. Another unit which you have always in electricity is kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours is 1000 watts for one hour. So you multiply a power with a time, then you get an energy. If you know that an hour has 3600 seconds and you know that a watt is a joule per second, you can easily calculate that a kilowatt hour is 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joule. So in a way it's 3.6 megajoule. Another unit which is quite often used is terawatt hours. If you talk about the energy consumption of a country, you often give it as terawatt hours but you do it annually, so if you do it physically correct, you have to say terawatt hours per year. And if you now know how much hours one year has, you find out that you can convert it into watt, so in a unit in joules per second. And then you find out that 8.8 .8 terawatt hours per year is the same as an average of one gigawatt. So this is already the end of this five minutes of physics. It took a little bit longer, but still I hope it was not too long for you. So thank you for listening. Next time we then talk about how to produce electricity and I will probably start with hydropower because that is physically the easiest way to understand. And this is one of the oldest ways to produce electricity in large scale. So thank you for listening and see you next time again. Goodbye. Thank you.